गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू दिस इवनिंग एपिसोड ऑफ परस्यू एंड वी हैव परस्यू 6 आर इट इज लिवर एंड जीआई पैथोलॉजी एंड वी आर स्ट्रीमिंग लाइव फ्रॉम यूसीएसएफ यूएसए वाया कोलकाता एंड वी हैव टू वेरी एमिनेंट पर्सनालिटीज डॉक्टर मनीता बाल हु इज द हेड ऑफ पैथोलॉजी एट द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ पैथोलॉजी टाटा मेमोरियल हॉस्पिटल मुंबई एंड शी इज इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन डिफाइनिंग वेरियस कोर्सेज इन इन tmh mumbai and is the person responsible for liver and gi and head and neck pathology at tmh mumbai uh, she will be moderating and she will be introducing dr sanjay kakkar so dr monita please take over and please introduce uh, dr kakkar and we'll start from there thank you so much dr pradeep for the kind introduction uh, now i have a very pleasant job of introducing professor sanjay kakkar who in my opinion does not need any introduction for the pathology community but for the students and uh, beginners i would say that professor kakkar is a master and an authority in gi and hpb tumors he is a towering figure in this vast field a teacher par excellence with a sterling career led with many accomplishments and very proud to say that uh, he did his md from pgi chandigarh in 1994 and uh, thereafter moved to the us and uh, now he is uh, the chief of the gi hpb service in uh, uc uh, ucsf san francisco he is the director of the fellowship program there in the gi hpb and staff pathologist in the uh, va medical center san francisco it will take me a whole day to go through his achievements uh, suffice it to say that all the reporting protocols guidelines that we follow religiously every day he has been a part of them all is led them uh, he has been president of uh, us gi pathology society vice president of hans popper society um, uh, member of the ajcc on gi and hpb iccr hcc expert is a cap cancer committee uh, member is the lead author on all the cancer, colorectal and hpb protocols so practically everything that we follow uh, in gi uh, 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 has been led by him or he's a part of it and uh, he is the editorial board uh, he's on the editorial board of human pathology and world journal of hepatology and has many many uh, uh, international publications in top journals and the best thing about him is uh, uh, he his his deep humility and his wonderful nature so today i'm very excited to be listening to him and learning from him uh, so sir please take the stage uh, it's all yours Well, good evening everyone and uh, thank you dr monita for such a generous introduction i thought you were introducing somebody else and i would also like to thank uh, dr nadeem uh, uh, for inviting me and those of you may not know that uh, you know, nadeem is like my uh, you know childhood friend and uh, not literally speaking but uh, uh, we spent our or started our career in pathology together as uh, in uh, pgi and this is an excellent effort uh, by dr nadeem putting uh, this series together and this resource out there in the internet for everybody to use okay so let me get this figured out uh, just press present now yeah and then your entire screen and then share the screen yeah So you can see my screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah, it's on okay. the way. Yeah. Yes, yes, you yeah. can see. Yes, there. Okay. All right. Please start. Thank so you. We're going to talk about some uh, uh, challenges in some uh, selected uh, liver tumors. You know, you can uh, uh, divide this uh, topic into uh, some uh, selected areas which are common problems in uh, diagnosis of uh, hepatic cell carcinoma cholangiac carcinomas and the well differentiated end hccs have to be distinguished from adenomas and fnh and so on and uh, there are non epithelial tumors which can uh, also mimic uh, hccs or sometimes even uh, cholangiac carcinomas so this is the part 1 and i'll be doing another session maybe a couple of months from now and uh, for this session i'm going to focus on these uh, three main areas so in uh, the beginning we'll go very briefly through commonly used markers and this is mainly for the uh, workup of hepatocellular tumors and this will be like a brief introduction 
into the uh, you know, advantages and some of the pitfalls of commonly used markers. And uh, I will suggest a proposed algorithm, which is uh, maybe not applicable in all cases, but it's helpful to think about liver tumors uh, from that perspective. And then uh, in the major portion of this session, we will go through uh, case examples. And I'm going to focus uh, on uh, cases you know, beyond uh, HCC and cholangiocarcinomas today. And maybe in the uh, next session, we'll focus uh, more on uh, hepatocellular carcinomas and cholangiocarcinomas and some of uh, and, uh, their close differential diagnosis. So let's start with uh, a brief review of the uh, you know, commonly used markers. So here is a, a list of... Uh, four of the hepatocellular markers which are uh, you know commonly used and we are all familiar with HEPR1 it has uh, you know high sensitivity and specificity for hepatocellular carcinomas uh, some of the limitations to keep in mind are that uh, a scurus HCC and poorly differentiated HCC the sensitivity of HEPR is uh, lower and in uh, some of the adenocarcinomas HEPR is known to be positive especially in gastroesophageal and lung adenocarcinomas and less commonly in a variety of others so here's an example of a gastric adenocarcinoma and you can see a diffuse strong positive staining uh, with the HEPR. Now arginase 1 is a urea cycle enzyme and as we know urea uh, synthesis occurs only in the hepatocytes so arginine is, is uh, specific for hepatocellular differentiation. And the advantages of HEPAR are that it has much higher sensitivity and specificity, including uh, scurious HCCs and poorly differentiated HCCs. Uh, it, it, not, no marker is perfect, so it can be negative in uh, a selected uh, around 10% or so of HCCs and uh, rarely in other uh, adenocarcinomas. I know that uh, from... Um, discussions with uh, you know, people who practice a lot of liver pathology in India, I have found out that origin is one for some reason does not work that well in the Indian setting. And I'm not sure what exactly uh, the reason for that is. And I, I do plan to get some of the origin is negative cases uh, from there and just try them out here to see what might be the uh, reason for the uh, discrepancy and uh, that there's much lower sensitivity. So you should keep that in mind when you're selecting uh, hepatocellular markers uh, uh, for HCC. Uh, here's a rare example of an intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma, and you can see that uh, the uh, HEPAR is, uh, or the arginase one rather, is very strongly positive in the tumor cell. But this is a, a quite a rare phenomenon, and in a vast majority of uh, cholangiocarcinomas as well as uh, other adenocarcinomas, uh, arginase one is uh, either negative or just shows some focal stain. We are familiar with Lipican 3 as a marker that can be used uh, for uh, HCC. It's an oncofetal antigen. The advantage that it offers is that it is uh, more sensitive in cases of scurious HCC and poorly differentiated HCCs. And since it is an oncofetal antigen, it is not expressed in benign uh, hepatocellular proliferations like uh, adenomas and uh, FNH. The uh, downside of it is that it has uh, a much lower sensitivity, perhaps less than 50% in well-differentiated HCCs. And uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that lipican 3 is not really a hepatocellular marker. It's an oncofetal antigen, and it can be expressed in a wide variety of malignant tumors, uh, uh, especially in germ cell tumors. So here's a, a, a study which uh, examined lipican 3 expression in more than 4,000 cases. And you can see a long list of uh, tumors that can be positive for glipican 3 uh, Hepatocellular carcinoma is still the most common, around two-thirds uh, in uh, this study. But then you can see a lot of other tumors. Uh, a lot of them don't enter the differential diagnosis of uh, HCC, but some of the notable ones you, know, you should keep in mind, like melanomas can be positive and... Uh, you know, some of the adenocarcinomas can be positive. Uh, virtually any malignant tumor can be positive. So you have to keep in mind that uh, if you're making a diagnosis of HCC based only on glipican 3 staining, when other hepatocellular markers are negative, so you have to be very careful in uh, that situation. So here's an example of a poorly differentiated HCC, which is uh, HEPR1 negative and uh, strongly positive for glipican 3 So that's one of the advantages of this marker in identification of poorly differentiated HCC. Uh, here is a serotic nodule, and you can see that there is no evidence of uh, 
at CC in this case. Uh, so patchy staining with glyphicon 3 can be seen in uh, serotic nodules, uh, also in uh, uh, livers which have a very active uh, inflammatory activity. So you can see glyphicon 3 staining in that setting as well. And the last marker on this list is a polyclonal CEA. And uh, CEA typically marks adenocarcinomas, but the if you use the polyclonal antibody, it uh, cross-reacts with the uh, glycoprotein in the canaliculus. And that's why you get this the characteristic canalicular pattern of staining, which is uh, thought to be specific uh, for uh, HCC. And the uh, limitations of this marker are that it can be you know, difficult to interpret canalicular versus you know, membrane staining that you can get in adenocarcinomas. And like uh, HAPAR, it has a lower sensitivity in uh, scurus as well as in poorly differentiated uh, hepatocellular carcinomas. So here's an example uh, uh, showing you the characteristic canalicular pattern of staining with HCC. So what you want to look for is uh, this kind of a branching configuration where you, you know, that's how the uh, canalicular IR, so you can see that's a kind of a V-shaped or T-shaped pattern of staining. So that's what you're looking for, not complete membrane staining which is uh, more characteristic of adenocarcinomas. And uh, you can also see this uh, kind of luminal accentuation with adenocarcinomas. And in some cases, it can be difficult to distinguish from canalicular pattern staining. So that's why uh, I think polyclonal CA is, is a useful marker, but probably not uh, like a first-line marker for the diagnosis of uh, HCC. So a variety of other markers can also be used. Um, and the AFP has much lower sensitivity. And all these markers, uh, Willen, CD10, and BCEP, all these uh, show pattern which is similar to polyclonal CEA. They have a canalicular pattern of staining. Uh, with the TTF1, depending on which clone you use, uh, you may get uh, cytoplasmic staining, not nuclear staining, like you get in uh, pulmonary adenocarcinomas. And this is very similar to HEPAR1. And so it really doesn't advant uh, offer any advantage, uh, but you just have to be uh, aware of that in case you come across uh, 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 this clone being stained and hepatocytes as well as HCC will show cytoplasmic staining. Uh, CD34 we know uh, can show diffuse sinusoidal staining, but is not specific. And uh, more recently, albumin in situ hybridization has become available. And uh, we know that albumin is synthesized only in hepatocytes. So if you look for mRNA, it should be present only in the hepatocytes. So that has served as uh, the principle for uh, this uh, assay. But albumin in situ hybridization is positive in both uh, HCC as well as cholangiocarcinomas. So it serves as a useful marker for primary hepatic tumors, and it does not distinguish between the two. Can you just press and that mic so that the doctor can go away, please? Sorry for interrupting. Just hey, yes, right thing, yeah, sorry. I I didn't uh, hear what you said. Yeah, just press that hide thing so that that pop-up just goes away because it's... it's oh, okay, okay. It's, uh, thank you, thank you. Sorry for bothering. Oh, yeah, no problem. So, albumin inside hybridization, as this uh, table shows, um, is uh, positive in um, you know, more than 90% of uh, reported cases of HCCs. And in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, around two thirds of them will show staining with albumin inside to hybridization. The other tumors uh, less uh, commonly can be positive, especially pancreatic acinar cell carcinoma. And that, in my experience, can be very strongly positive for albumin inside to hybridization. Uh, so, here's a table from a, a recent publication showing you the whole range of tumors that can be positive. If you uh, go on the uh, spectrum, which are 3 plus or 4 plus positive, so strongly positive, it's only in HCC and cholangiocarcinomas, but patchy staining or weak staining can be seen in a variety of uh, other tumors uh, as well. So here's an example showing you the, you know, the granular uh, staining in HCCs with albumin in situ and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, which uh, it, they can be more diffuse as well, but I chose a case to show you because most cases will show this kind of more patchy but quite strong staining in yes. the tumor cells. On the other hand, uh, we often use adenocarcinoma markers when they're not really specific for adenocarcinomas, but they're more common in adenocarcinomas. And a variety of them, uh, like MOX31 antibody, CK7, CK19 can be used. Uh, 
and most adenocarcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors are positive, and, but a variable number of HCCs will also show uh, positivity with these markers. Uh, pancytokeratin, if you use a, a, a cocktail which has been properly titrated, it will be positive in most of the hepatocellular carcinomas. So here's an example showing you hepatocellular carcinoma, which is showing uh, you know, uh, uh, MOC31 staining, and another example of HCC with the CK19 positivity. So this was seen around 10 to maybe 20% of HCCs, and uh, uh, CK19 positive HCCs have been associated with a uh, more aggressive uh, clinical course. So with this background, let's uh, examine a case uh, to see some of the you know, highlight the pitfalls rather of uh, uh, these immunistic chemical uh, markers. Uh, you may have seen this case if you've seen one of my earlier presentations, and I really like this case because it really illustrates some of the limitations uh, of these markers very well. So this is a 66-year-old who had a 6 centimeter liver mass on imaging. There was uh, no other uh, liver tumor, and you can see a small portion of uh, a non-neoplastic liver here, and here you have a tumor which is more compact. Uh, other areas of the tumor had more fibrous stroma. So here's a closer view of the tumor, and uh, it's composed of these uh, you know, polygonal, very hepatoid-looking cells with uh, moderate to abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, and these are arranged in nests or somewhat in trabecular area formations in some areas like here. Another closer view of the tumor, which highlights this nests and trabecular tumors, uh, its frequent uh, mitotic activity. And in some areas, you can see sort of acinar like uh, formations uh, as well. So, given the fact that this is in the liver and this uh, has this polygonal cell or hepatoid look to it, you know, the workup included uh, hepatocellular markers. And you can see that a hepar is uh, positive, uh, showing very strong staining in some tumor cells and more moderate staining in uh, many of the others. And here's the uh, profile um, that um, this case was sent with. These are the stains that were sent when this case was sent to uh, us. So, so you can see hepar was positive and some of the other markers that were done uh, were negative. Uh, TTF1 was done because there were lung masses uh, as well. So the question at this point is, you know, you have a hepatocellular looking tumor, which is uh, HEPAR positive, and there's no other you know, mass lesion based on uh, you know, imaging. So what is the diagnosis? Are we, are we done? Is it a hepatocellular carcinoma? Or is it possible that we are dealing with a non-hepatocellular tumor, which is showing a aberrant staining with uh, the HEPAR? So what I like to advocate is a mesothelioma-like approach in the diagnosis of uh, you know, liver tumors. So in mesotheliomas, the uh, standard practice is to use two mesothelioma and two adenocarcinoma markers because of the you know, lack of uh, fidelity of these markers. And the same principle applies uh, in the uh, setting of hepatocellular tumors that uh, th these markers are not specific. So we uh, should be using, especially in the setting of uh, non serotic liver, uh, two hepatocellular markers and two markers that are more common in adenocarcinomas for proper classification. Yeah. Um, in uh, some settings, uh, such as cirrhosis or in, uh, if the morphologically you're seeing bile production, then you probably don't need uh, a more extensive immunistic chemical workup. But in most settings, it's helpful to uh, combine two markers from each of these categories. And you, you can pick up uh, the markers based on what is available to you and what you have experience with. As I mentioned, origin is one uh, may not work that well in the uh, setting in India, so you can uh, choose uh, uh, two of the other markers. I typically choose origin is one and HEPAR one. If it is poorly differentiated, I might add clipicon three as well. And then from the uh, other column, I typically do uh, use CK19, and then any one of the mark thirty one or CK seven uh, would work uh, well. So if we try to uh, apply uh, this approach in the case that I showed you, and uh, two stains were added, so it was HEPAR and CK was positive, CK7 negative. So we added arginase and MOC31, and you can see that it was arginase negative, and MOC31 was uh, strongly positive. So uh, what are we left with now? So it's possible that it's an arginase negative HCC, 
or it's a non hepatocellular tumor which has an aberrant HEPAR1 expression. And as I mentioned, you can see that in a variety of adenocarcinomas and less commonly in neuroendocrine neoplasms. I haven't really seen that with renal cell carcinomas, but I'm sure that rare HEPAR1 staining can be seen in a wide variety of tumors. So based on this uh, you know, somewhat aberrant pattern of staining, uh, additional markers were obtained, and this tumor was very strongly positive for both uh, uh, chromogranin and uh, synaptophysin. And although a clear primary site was not evident, uh, there was some vague lesion in the pancreas, uh, this was uh, evidence of a neuroendocrine carcinoma which had an aberrant HEPAR1 expression. So I know that there's already been a session on the neuroendocrine neoplasm, so I'm not going to go into detail into neuroendocrine carcinomas. But what I want to emphasize, uh, especially based on this case, is uh, an approach of, uh, of viewing hepatocellular tumors with, uh, based on the results of two stains. So one hepatocellular marker and one marker, which is more common in adenocarcinomas. And uh, among the hepatocellular markers, I, mean, I have used arginase 1, but you can uh, just replace that with HEPAR and CK19. So if you just use those two stains and uh, divide the liver tumors, then you can only have four possible categories. Right? So you can have a tumor which is uh, arginase negative or HEPAR uh, 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 um, arginase positive or HEPAR positive and uh, CK19 negative. And in that setting, it would be a hepatocellular carcinoma unless uh, it is, uh, um, you know, clinical or radiologic findings are apparent. So in the vast majority of cases in uh, group one, we are dealing with HCC. So group two would be uh, if it's negative for arginase and positive for CK19. And in a vast majority of cases, in this would be uh, likely a a non-hepatocellular tumor adenocarcinoma, it could be a neuroendocrine or it could be one of the other um, carcinomas uh, or it could be one of the uh, hepatocellular carcinomas which is arginase or HEPAR or negative depending on which one you are using. So group 3 would be positive for both CK19 and arginase and uh, in a vast majority of cases uh, this would be uh, a CK19 positive uh, HCC. And then there is group 4, which will be negative for both arginase as well as CK19. And this is a very diverse group of tumors. And uh, this is actually one of the most interesting group as well. And you can uh, divide this group into two broad categories. So if you do a pan-cytokeratin stain, the arginase negative or HEPAR negative and CK19 negative tumors will fall under kind of two categories. The keratin positive ones would uh, still be HCCs and some of the other uh, carcinomas which have kind of polygonal cell morphology, um, adenocarcinomas, neuroendocrine, renal cell carcinoma, uh, less commonly urothelial and squamous cell carcinomas uh, can metastasize to the liver. But it's the keratin negative category that you really have to be uh, very careful about. Uh, and uh, these tumors can very closely resemble HCC morphologically. And if you don't think about it, these uh, can easily you know, be overlooked. So by dividing these tumors in the liver into, you know, these four groups, it can be very helpful in deciding which uh, uh, path you want to follow with additional workup or if additional workup is uh, even needed. So let's uh, look at some of the examples um, illustrating this approach. And before I start doing that, I want to ask you this very important question. And I know we can't have feedback or polls, but I really want you to think and if you want to be a good liver pathologist, you really have to be able to answer this question. And the question is, what do gnomes and elves have in common? So you might be thinking, like, what kind of crazy question is this? Uh, you know, you've seen gnomes and elves in all kind of fairy tales, but what does this have to do with liver pathology? Well, gnomes and elves, uh, the thing that they have in common are that they are great liver pathologists. And if you're not aware of this, uh, I would refer you to this uh, you know, recent article that was published uh, as a review of uh, history of liver pathology. So there was an international liver pathology group that was formed, and that was like nearly 50 years back, with all the you know, great names that 
uh, we are familiar with uh, from our textbooks and uh, they formed this group and uh, this group came to be known as the gnomes and they would meet together and you know brainstorm about uh, liver pathology share cases with each other and uh, this was kind of a closed group they were a, maybe a group of like 15 pathologists or so and this was an international group so the next generation of pathologists uh, who came along they were really inspired by the gnomes group and they realized that they can't find entry into gnomes because you know, they didn't want the gnomes group to become too big so they formed a new group and they called it the elves and uh, um, you know people who mentor me they are all part of elves uh, you know one of my mentors linda farrell is part of the elves group and they continued the tradition of uh, you know, meeting at regular intervals uh, sharing uh, liver pathology cases and uh, you know publishing some review articles off and on uh, as well. So I was talking one day, this was many years ago, with some of my liver pathology you know, colleagues across the country, and we decided, you know, we should also form a group. Uh, so we started thinking of names, like what names should we uh, come up with? So we came up with a, a variety of different names, like goblins and so forth. But it's, uh, you know, these are very uh, benign-looking gnomes. Uh, they sound very friendly. You know, we have to found, sound a little more aggressive. So we came up with the name of Gremlins, and uh, so here's uh, some of the uh, names that you will recognize. So we, we formed this kind of informal study group uh, uh, to exchange ideas and to, you know, uh, do some studies in liver pathology. And I encourage all of you to, you know, form such or similar groups with like-minded people. It really is very stimulating to, uh, you know, have discussions with the friends and colleagues across the country uh, about uh, different ideas and how to pursue them. Okay, let's proceed to, uh, with another case. So uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, maybe uh, show you another two or three cases and then I'll uh, take a break and uh, take some questions uh, from you and then we can keep going. So this uh, uh, is uh, continuing on the theme that I started with uh, of uh, liver tumors which are going beyond HCC and cholangiocarcinoma. So this is a 35-year-old with a history of uh, IV drug use. Uh, this patient uh, died in a car accident and uh, the organs were being considered for transplant. And uh, while this was being done, a four centimeter liver mass was noted by the surgeon and was sent for a frozen section. And the pathologist reviewed the case. So this is what uh, the pathologist saw. That this was a tumor which uh, I had somewhat of a polygonal cell appearance. Maybe you can imagine some, you know, some trabeculae here and uh, you know, some moderate amount of cytoplasm, not much in terms of uh, cytologic uh, atypia. And here's a closer look uh, at the tumor. So based on uh, this, uh, a diagnosis of uh, hepatocellular adenoma was uh, rendered at the frozen section. This was a young woman. And and a variety of uh, organs, including the liver, kidneys, heart, and I think even lungs, uh, they were transplanted to multiple donors. And uh, following that, uh, a, a couple of days later, the uh, permanent sections from the frozen came along. And then uh, uh, this is a, the, the permanent HNE uh, section. So you can see some of similar features. So kind of polygonal cells and uh, mostly arranged in kind of sheets without any uh, specific pattern. But then some of the areas I started showing this uh, necrosis. And then here's a closer view of uh, some uh, minor atypia, not uh, very marked atypia, but uh, uh, you can see some pleomorphism, prominent nucleoli. So the pathologist started to get worried. And here's another view, there's a mitosis also. So at this point, the pathologist was worried that this might be uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and multiple organs had already been transplanted by this time. So the pathologist got a reticulant stain and was even more worried now because you can see there's hardly any reticulant framework in this uh, tumor. And then um, additional workup, uh, the glutamine synthetase stain was obtained and uh, you know, this stain is a good marker for uh, beta catenin activation. If you see diffuse and strong staining as you're seeing in this case, it's a marker of beta catenin activation, which you can see in uh, hepatocellular carcinomas and in adenomas, which are considered to be uh, high risk. So at this point, uh, the pathologist was really worried that this might be a malignant tumor and uh, it had been already 
you know, the organs had been transplanted already. So this is the point that the case was sent for consultation and I got the case for review. Uh, so let's see what the additional workup showed. So the hepatocellular markers are actually all negative in this case. And even the pancytokinetin was negative. So let's go back to our table that I uh, showed you for uh, both hepatocellular marker negative and CK19 negative tumors. So we are in this category of uh, keratin negative tumors now. And a lot of these tumors are fairly ominous. If uh, you have a melanoma and you have transplanted all the organs, you know, that's very ominous. If you see some of the literature, there have been, uh, you know, many, many horror stories of uh, uh, transplanted organs uh, developing metastatic disease after uh, occult disease have was, that was not known at the time of death and multiple organs have been transplanted. So you have to be very careful in the evaluation of frozen sections in uh, such situations. Additional workup, although showed that this tumor was positive for HMB45 as well as uh, uh, smooth muscle markers, so smooth muscle actin was positive. And uh, you know, that clearly established the diagnosis of an epithelioid uh, angiomyolipoma. Uh, so epithelioid uh, angiomyolipoma can very closely resemble hepatocellular tumors uh, because the epithelioid morphology resembles uh, like epithelial tumor. And these tumors in the liver can often be uh, monotypic. That is, uh, the angio component or the lipo component may not be very clearly apparent. So some of the features that can help on uh, HNE is that uh, uh, these tumor cells often have indistinct uh, cell borders. You can see they are kind of merging into each other. And uh, yeah, that's apparent even at low power. And you can see they're kind of streaming look to it, uh, which uh, is different from epithelial tumors, which appear kind of more compact uh, and more well delineated. And you can also see some spindling of uh, the tumor cells. So this is a very common feature even in uh, epithelial and angiomyolipoma. If you see foci of uh, extramedullary hematopoiesis, that can be helpful. It's a feature in some of these tumors. And sometimes you can get a collection of these foamy um, histiocytes in angiomyolipomas, which uh, it's not a specific feature, but it can help you uh, alert uh, to this uh, uh, diagnosis. So once you think about it, the diagnosis is actually very straightforward because the immunohistochemistry is highly characteristic. It's a keratin negative, and it is in the family of the perivascular epithelioid cell tumors or picomas. And these uh, tumors characteristically show myomelanocytic differentiation. So you will see a positivity for melanocytic markers, HMB45 and so forth, as well as uh, myogenic markers. And that's a very characteristic uh, profile. The S100 is uh, negative in these state cases, so that helps in distinction from um, the melanomas. And as I mentioned, keratin is uh, negative as well. So in uh, rare cases, you can uh, see uh, uh, TFE3 positive. This is uh, one of the more recent subtypes that has been reported for angiomyolipoma, but this is very rare. So I'm just mentioning it so that you are aware that uh, a small subset will show translocations uh, involving the TFE3 gene, and they can be positive immunostochemically for a TFE3. Now, what about uh, benign versus malignant? You know, as I mentioned in the case that I showed you, this patient uh, had organs transplanted, multiple organs that had been transplanted. So, should we be worried that angiomyolipoma case uh, has been a source of uh, organs for these multiple patients. So in a wide variety or a wide number, wide majority of cases, these tumors are benign. I would say more than 95% of uh, uh, hepatic angiomyolipomas are benign. But the criteria for malignancy are not very well defined. The large size, atypia, necrosis, and so forth have been suggested. But uh, none of them really uh, pan out because a lot of these features are seen in tumors which uh, behave in a benign fashion. Now, uh, there's a study of 35 GI um, angiomyolipomas or picomas, which came up with these uh, criteria for malignancy. But uh, these are present uh, in up to you know, one fourth of cases, even without uh, um, metastasis. So cases which do not uh, show the malignant outcome can also show 
uh, many of the features that define the uh, malignant angioma lipomas. In the case that I showed you, it had necrosis, but it was a small tumor. It did not have much in terms of atypia. So in all likelihood, the prognosis was that it's going to behave in a benign fashion, although there's no guarantee for that. And uh, even perfectly benign-looking angiomyolipomas in the liver have been known to occur and uh, are metastasized. So you all, always have to keep uh, this possibility in mind that every angiomyolipoma is potentially malignant, even though it's a very a rare uh, occurrence. It's also useful to know that uh, uh, angiomyolipomas, the malignant ones, uh, some of them anecdotally have been very successfully treated with uh, mTOR inhibitors. So let's uh, go on to the next case. Uh, this was an angiomyolipoma that I showed you. So the next one is an 89-year-old with a history of gastric ulcer. And uh, this was a 5-centimeter liver mass. And this is a needle biopsy. So on the low power, you can uh, see the sheets of tumor cells, which some of them appear to have either vacuoles or some clearing of the cytoplasm. And here are some uh, tumor cells. And there's no particular arrangement. They just appear to be in uh, sheets of tumor cells. And let's take a closer look at them. Uh, overall, mild cytologic atypia. A lot of them have these vacuolated cytoplasm. And uh, somewhat of a polygonal cell look to them. And uh, no discernible arrangement, just sheets of these uh, you know, polygonal-looking cells with uh, vacuoles. Uh, on low bar, you could see that it's kind of encircling maybe some of the portal areas. And uh, here is the immunistic chemical workup that was done. And you can see that uh, the keratin is negative in these uh, tumor cells. A wide variety of markers that were obtained including hepatocellular markers, neuroendocrine markers, markers for renal, uh, urothelial, and CK720, uh, melanocytic, myogenic, all of those, uh, uh, that workup was uh, negative in this case. And again, we are in the category of uh, uh, the tumor which are negative for hepatocellular markers as well as CK19. And we are looking at this column again of tumors, which uh, are very distinctive in, in their immunistic chemical profile. So you always have to think about them. And once you think about them, you can uh, come to the diagnosis. And in addition to the, the tumors that I mentioned here at the top, you have to always think that sarcomas can have an epithelioid pattern. And these can very closely mimic uh, carcinomas, including a hepatocellular carcinoma. And this was the marker which was diffusely positive in the tumor cells, which uh, led to the uh, diagnosis. And this is a, a kit. And this was a case of actually metastatic GI stromal tumor. This patient did have an ulcerated uh, a mass in the stomach, which had been biopsied. And they only got the ulcer. And uh, they did not uh, biopsy the mass initially. And uh, based on the liver biopsy, when the uh, diagnosis of metastatic just uh, was established. So let's look at another very similar looking uh, case, or rather similar category of case, of a 72-year-old hepatitis C, tumor nodules in liver, lung, as well as uh, bones, widely metastatic disease. Uh, because the patient had hepatitis C, and the clinical suspicion, of course, was that uh, this was uh, uh, HCC, which was widely metastatic. And uh, here's a liver biopsy, which shows, once again, sheets of these uh, kind of polygonal looking uh, tumor cells, a very similar theme that I've shown you so far today. And a closer look, uh, you can uh, maybe imagine some kind of trabecular arrangement, but mostly it's in large sheets or large nests of tumor cells. And once again, the atypia is not very striking. So overall, kind of milder, at most uh, of moderate cytologic uh, atypia. They do have a polygonal or hepatoid like appearance, so this could easily be a, a hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. And here's a reticle and stain that had been obtained, which uh, shows that uh, there's hardly any reticle and framework uh, in this tumor. So the combination of this, as well as the history and the morphology, can easily aid you to believe that you're dealing with uh, a hepatocellular carcinoma. But the workup for hepatocellular carcinoma was negative, and so was CK19. 
and once again we are in this group of keratin negative tumors and for the workup showed S100 as well as SOC stem positivity. So this was a case of uh, you know, metastatic uh, melanoma in a patient who did have chronic liver disease. And uh, uh, further probing of the history did reveal that uh, this patient had a remote history of uh, a skin melanoma that was removed you know, many years back. So melanoma can metastasize after several years. Uh, and you also always has to keep that uh, uh, possibility in mind. So I'm going to show you this case and then, then we have, I'll briefly stop and uh, see if anybody has any questions or comments for discussion. So this is perhaps a case which I think most closely resembles HCC. This entity can be virtually indistinguishable from it. And this is a 62 year old who had uh, multiple liver and lung masses and this is a, a liver biopsy and you can see a tumor that um, has uh, this broad nest centrobeculae and uh, morphology is very similar in terms of the theme that I've shown today that you see these around to polygonal uh, cells and these uh, you know, uh, very wide trabeculae kind of sinusoid lined by these sinusoids so you can easily be uh, dealing with a uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or uh, the uniform nature of tumor cells indicate that it could even be a, a neuroendocrine tumor. And uh, let's look at uh, what the workup showed. So all the uh, markers uh, for um, HCC were negative and uh, synaptophysin is, is what is shown here that it is just, it was a patchy positive but it was pretty strong uh, staining for synaptophysin in the tumor cells. The K67 proliferation index was 11%. And so the question at this point is that are we dealing with uh, a grade 2 neuroendocrine tumor, which is metastatic to the liver, or could it be a neoplasm which has neuroendocrine differentiation but is uh, not a neuroendocrine tumor or neuroendocrine carcinoma, or are we dealing with altogether you know, another uh, tumor here? So once again, let's go back uh, to our table. This, this uh, case was uh, uh, not only negative for hepatocellular markers, but uh, the keratin was also negative. And I showed you that the synaptophysin was positive, which is pointing towards uh, neuroendocrine tumors along with the morphologic appearance, which was uh, very much like uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. But neuroendocrine tumors are almost always positive for pan keratin. And you can see keratin negativity in uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas, especially in a small subset of uh, you know, small cell uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas. But in well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, it is uh, unusual for keratin to be like totally negative. Uh, it was totally negative in uh, this case. So if we now move to the keratin negative category, and we have to keep in mind that the synaptophysin was positive. So we have several tumors uh, here, or more than one tumor here in this category, which can be synaptophysin positive. So let's uh, look at some of the additional workup that was done in this case. And uh, here is an inhibin stain, which is showing some patchy, weak to moderate staining and uh, very strong nuclear staining diffusely in the tumor cells with SF1 or uh, steroidogenic factor one. And this is a very characteristic finding that you see with the adrenocortical carcinomas. And the metastatic adrenocortical carcinoma to the liver, a you know, few cases that I've seen, they're virtually indistinguishable from uh, uh, HCC. And a couple of cases, there was uh, no history provided of uh, an adrenal mass uh, when the liver biopsy uh, was reviewed. So some of these stains that have been used uh, for adrenocortical carcinoma include, uh, you know, melon A is positive, inhibin, calretinin can be positive. And all those uh, have a variable sensitivity and SF1 is probably that has the highest sensitivity for uh, this uh, diagnosis. Uh, you have to be careful that SF1 is by itself is not, uh, you know, diagnostic of adrenocortical carcinomas. You can see that in a variety of uh, other tumors, uh, such as uh, you know sex cord stromal tumors as well. So you have to keep the overall context, uh, including the clinical context, the morphology, as well as the overall immunohistochemical profile um, before you reach the diagnosis. 
Another uh, point that I want to emphasize is that whenever you're dealing with these different diagnostic entities, you should ask yourself, what difference does it make? So, you know, here we are dealing with um, a tumor that is positive for synaptophysin, and this was in fact initially diagnosed as a metastatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor. So the question that you should always be asking in the um, these different uh, diagnostic considerations is like, what difference does it make? What is the impact? So whether you call it neuroendocrine tumor or adrenal cortical carcinoma, how is it going to make any difference for the patient? So here is how it will uh, matter. So adrenal cortical carcinoma is, uh, you know, vast majority of them are have spread beyond their adrenal diagnosis, and the treatment is very different than neuroendocrine tumors. So you can have, so there's a typical chemotherapy that is used is, uh, you know, mitotain, which is uh, directed against the hormones that are secreted and uh, this uh, chemotherapeutic drug combination. On the other hand, neuroendocrine tumor uh, treatments are like totally different. You know, you are more likely to, uh, you know, uh, see treatment with somatostatin analogs and, uh, you know, there are a variety of other therapies that are available. But uh, this chemotherapeutic regime is, uh, are not used for neuroendocrine tumors. Okay, yeah. well, let's do this case and then I will stop uh, for some questions because this is sort of related to the uh, case that we were just uh, looking at. So this is another uh, pitfall that I wanted to point out. Uh, whenever you make a diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor based on, especially based on a metastatic setting like in the liver, uh, you should always uh, um, keep in mind that it's a good idea to get a keratin stain along with it. So I showed an example of uh, a synaptophysin positive tumor, which looks like neuroendocrine tumor, but was adenocortical carcinomas. And adenocortical carcinomas typically are keratin negative or you know just weakly positive. And here's another tumor which can be very uh, close mimic of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So this is a 40 year old uh, male, abdominal mass, uh, it was not clear from the imaging where it was arising, and it was thought to be, you know, possible pancreatic uh, origin. And uh, yeah, here you can see the morphology. It has got these nests of tumor cells. Uh, once again, kind of polygonal cell look to it. Uh, uh, looks very much like uh, a neuroendocrine tumor. I think it, you can also consider that it could be a paracellular carcinoma. But uh, yeah, very much reminiscent of a neuroendocrine type morphology, uniform tumor cells uh, with uh, uh, a nested kind of appearance. And uh, here's the chromogranin synaptophysin, which is uh, both of the stains were diffusely positive, and KI67 uh, proliferation index was 7%. So, once again, the consideration here in this case is are we dealing with uh, a grade 2 neuroendocrine tumor or not? And the keratin, once again, is negative in this case, just like in the previous case I showed you. And we have the same diagnostic considerations to go through. And I show you this table again and again. So we are in the keratin negative category. So it looks like a neuroendocrine tumor based on the morphology and staining pattern. But we are in the keratin negative category, so you have to consider some of the other tumors which are on this list. And... Uh, um, you always have to keep this uh, tumor in mind, which is uh, a paraganglioma. Uh, you know, metastatic paragangliomas were thought to be common, but now we know that increasingly uh, paragangliomas, especially the ones that occur in uh, the hereditary setting, they have a higher propensity for metastasis, uh, and uh, these often occur in the uh, younger patients. And this uh, you know, classic uh, textbook picture of this cell burden or tightly and tight nests of tumor cells with separated by this rich uh, uh, capillary network. That's a classic textbook description. But you often don't see that, uh, especially in the metastatic setting. And uh, if you uh, do S100 stain, it can help in highlighting the uh, uh, sustentacular cells, which uh, can surround these uh, nests of cells. But just like uh, uh, the morphology may not be classic in the metastatic setting, you may not get S100 staining in the metastatic setting as well. So that's also not very really reliable uh, to make this diagnosis. So you have to have a high index of suspicion, keep the clinical setting in mind, the morphology, the fact that uh, uh, keratin is negative in the context of um, 
of positive neuroendocrine markers. And you can always get S100. It may or may not be helpful in uh, the metastatic uh, paraganglioma. Now, it's very important to uh, keep a paraganglioma in mind uh, because a significant percentage of these occur in the uh, hereditary setting. And one of the settings that I just wanted to uh, mention today was uh, um, the uh, setting where you have paragangliomas because of loss of function of this enzyme, which is a succinate dehydrogenase. So this is one of the Krebs cycle uh, enzymes, and uh, it has uh, several subunits. You can see SDHA, B, B, C, and D. And the reason that it becomes uh, important from uh, uh, the pathology point of view is that uh, there's a even a chemical assay available for the SDHB enzyme. And uh, the paraganglomas that occur in the setting of um, um, mutations in uh, the SDH enzymes can be detected by SDHB immunohistochemistry. So they will show loss of SDHB. So irrespective of um, the mutations being in any of these uh, subunits, the SDHB is lost. So that can be a very useful assay uh, for uh, detection of these uh, tumors in the hereditary setting. Here's an example of uh, SDHB stain. Uh, this is uh, normal. So this paraganglioma uh, shows uh, the strong cytoplasmic staining, which is the normal pattern of staining. So if it occurs in the hereditary setting, you will see a loss of this uh, cytoplasmic staining in the tumor cells. So once again, let's uh, examine from the treatment point of view, like why is it important to distinguish paragangliomas and neuroendocrine tumors? And once again, it's, the reason is that the treatment that's offered is very different in both the cases. So for metastatic or unresectable paragangliomas, the chemotherapy that is used is uh, uh, this uh, combination is different than what's used in neuroendocrine tumors. And more recently, a more targeted therapy, which uh, you know, stops the... Uh, it, it, it targets the uh, production of hormones by the tumor cells is, uh, has been approved uh, by the FDA. I, and I, I'm not sure whether it's uh, uh, fully established uh, as a standard protocol, but I think this is used in cases which are refractory to treatment. On the other hand, uh, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, as we talked about, uh, are treated with a variety of modalities, but not by the chemotherapy or the options that are used in uh, paraganglio. So I've highlighted uh, you know, several uh, uh, tumors that are keratin negative and can resemble either HCCs or uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And if you keep them in mind, the diagnosis is uh, are not that difficult because uh, they, they have very characteristic uh, uh, immunohistochemical profiles. So before I go to the next case, let me uh, you know, uh, pause and see if uh, you have any uh, questions. I was told that you could unmute uh, uh, the question, or if there's anything on the chat. Uh, okay. Uh, can I come in here? Yes, go ahead, Manita. So, uh, in lovely cases, wonderful cases, packed with life lessons, and I think uh, you hit the nail on the head when you say that uh, these keratin negative differentials, they are real pitfalls, and uh, they can totally mimic HCC, and they should be kept in mind, and I think uh, uh, that your pearls of weight are uh, really, really going to be useful to everyone who's listening, and especially when you emphasize uh, that the treatment have, uh, should be kept in mind. Um, I have a question regarding uh, neuroendocrine marker positivity in HCC. So sometimes the uh, hepatocellular markers don't, don't turn up, but uh, neuroendocrine markers are uh, uh, focally positive. Or So that positivity we, we understand can be seen to some extent uh, in HCCs also. So uh, how do you think um, we should approach? Suppose there is a focal synaptophysin positivity, a weak uh, marginal yeah. from a brand and positivity uh, and none of the hepatocellular markers light up but there is mitosis and you, you on morphology favored HCC but now the neuroendocrine markers are positive so how yeah. far do you carry it? I think it's a, it's a very uh, uh, important problem that we face uh, in uh, especially in the metastatic setting that synaptophysin and chromogranin 
or sometimes, especially saptophysin, is sometimes focally positive and uh, in some cases it's even you know, more strongly and more diffusely positive. And uh, it occurs both in tumors which uh, resemble HCC and even in endocarcinomas. And sometimes we are faced with situations where we just can, well, based on morphology and staining, we can only say it's a poorly differentiated carcinoma and we can't go further. And then we see the synaptophysin staining, which is patchy, and uh, chromogranin is, in most cases, negative in this setting. And uh, the question whether it's a neuroendocrine versus uh, just a poorly differentiated carcinoma, whether it's HCC or some other poorly differentiated carcinoma, can be extremely challenging. So how to approach that? So if it's in the liver and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is a diagnostic uh, consideration, then uh, you just have to go down whatever, um, you know, uh, tools that you have in your uh, arsenal. So if you have, let's say, only used HEPAR and arginase in your first round, then you have to just use whatever else you have in uh, those uncommon cases. So if I have a case which I think could be HCC based on you know, morphology and maybe the clinical setting of cirrhosis, but it's not marking for the typical marker, then I just go down and use everything that I have. And now we also have albumin insight or hybridization that we're using in addition to, you know, the HEPAR, the clopican, arginase, polyclonal CEA. The markers which have lower sensitivity like, you know, AFP and uh, CD10 in, you know, a small subset of cases, I've even used those because if the suspicion is very strong, then it's HCC. I agree. Uh, from the neuroendocrine angle, you can also use insulinoma associated protein 1, INSM1, which is available. Um, yes, and yes. There's a doubt about neuroendocrine tumors. And I know a lot of uh, labs in India have that marker uh, you know, uh, available, so that's another possibility. But there will be some cases which you will not be able to resolve, even if you do everything. And uh, you know, the other markers for neuroendocrine carcinomas like... Uh, um, retinoblastoma protein, like loss of RB, if you see that, it will favor neuroendocrine. So, you know, you just have to go by the morphology and clinical setting and add stains. And uh, in some cases where you reach a dead end, you didn't just have to say it's a polydifferentiated carcinoma. And, you know, further subset of those cases, profile, molecular profiling with sequencing uh, can suggest if the mutational profile is uh, suggestive. Okay, okay, wonderful. Uh, we have one question, uh, if I'm allowed to ask. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Gandhi is asking, uh, if how do you distinguish between uh, CK19 positive HCC versus uh, mixed uh, combined uh, cholangio HCC versus hepatoid adenocarcinomas? Yeah, yeah, that's a very loaded question. So let's first uh, address the first part of it, uh, uh, CK19 positivity in HCC versus uh, an adenocarcinoma or a cholangiocarcinoma. So if you see the criteria for diagnosis of a combined HCC cholangiocarcinoma, it requires a two morphologic components. So you have to have a component of HCC and a component uh, of uh, a cholangiocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma, and then you confirm those based on immunohistochemistry. So if the tumor looks like hepatocellular carcinoma, it stains like hepatocellular carcinoma, and just happens to have positivity with CK19, CK7, or Mark31 along with it, then it does not meet the criteria uh, for a cholangiocarcinoma or a mixed or a combined HCC cholangiocarcinoma. So what do we want to see? to make sure that there is a cholangiocarcinoma component along with the HCC. So what, what we want to see is, in the best case scenario, we want to see, you know, well-formed and discrete glands in fibrous tumor. I know if you see that, then it's pretty straightforward. If there's a more poorly differentiated component and uh, you do not have well-formed discrete glands, then uh, one of the forgotten things often is mucins. You know, always look for a mucin stain. So let's say even mucin is negative and you have a poorly differentiated component. Then what we would like to see is, you know, our CK19 or CK7 strongly positive and negativity for hepatocellular markers in that component. So those are the things that we're looking for for a different diagnosis of combined HCC cholangio. So two distinct components. 
And as I mentioned, there will be cases where you will reach a dead end. You will just not be able to say for sure whether an additional cholangio component is present or it's a poorly differentiated carcinoma, which way to go. And in those cases, uh, sequencing can be helpful because some of the uh, changes that you see, um, uh, genomic changes are very distinct in HCC and cholangio carcinoma. Like, uh, uh, the you know, mutations in the beta catenin or third promoter mutations are very characteristic of HCCs, while in cholangiocarcinoma you see a variety of you know very typical mutations like IDH and uh, uh, you know uh, FGFR2 fusion and so on. So if you have characteristic abnormalities, uh, that can help. And the second thing, so do you think uh, uh, bind is now more in the category of HCC? Only, so does it uh, because molecularly usually it shares molecular profile with HCC, the combined uh, HCC cholangio. So do you think it fits more with? Uh, and we need not break our heads with the CK19 positive stem cell uh, HCC versus poorly differentiated combined. Yeah, so you know you can view it from two different angles. So one is uh, the angle of pathogenesis of how the tumor is. How the where is the cholangiocarcinoma coming from? So in those, uh, from that angle, it's possible that uh, the cholangiocarcinoma arises as trans differentiation from HCCs. Uh, but from a practical point of view, you have to distinguish uh, those because, as I mentioned earlier, the treatment is what's important. The treatment for if you have a cholangiocarcinoma component, whether it's just cholangiocarcinoma or as a part of HCC cholangiocarcinoma. And the treatment is very different. And those patients, uh, depending on uh, you know what the clinical setting is, if uh, let's say the clinical setting is the patient can be transplanted, has cirrhosis, at least in the U.S., um, the uh, diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma or combined HCC cholangio will virtually exclude the patient from a transplant because uh, the risk of recurrence is much higher. And there are studies now that may change in the future, but at present at least. And similarly, the chemotherapy um, that is used for a cholangio component, whether it's a cholangiocarcinoma or HCC cholangio, these patients may be offered uh, chemotherapy e either after surgery or even after uh, you know, transplant sometimes. And that chemotherapy, like uh, the gemcitabine-based regimens, are not used at HCCs. So from a practical point of view, it still is a challenge, and we have to focus on distinguishing HCCs from HCC cholangiocarcinomas, at least for the time being. And uh, yeah, other uh, yeah, you go ahead. Is there a cutoff uh, of the glandular component? Sometimes there is a peripheral uh, atypical ducts, which are, uh, you know, we keep on discussing whether it's a malignant glandular component or just uh, a, a very extensive ductal reaction at the periphery. Uh, so is there a cutoff, uh, like for some of the combined tumors, uh, for other systems we have cutoffs so for a substantial, so we know WHO just says that a uh, recognizable uh, definite glandular and a definite hepatocellular component, but uh, do you think a cutoff, uh, any recognizable glands, uh, what, how can we make this easy? Yeah, so that's a question that is often comes up about the uh, cutoffs. And, uh, you know, there are some cutoffs that have been proposed, especially in pancreatic tumors, that to call it mixed, you have to have 30%. And that 30% number was pulled out of a hat. It has no data backing it that 30% should be a mixed and like, or 25% is not a mixed tumor. So in the liver, there is no such uh, um, minimum criteria for diagnosis of HCC, a combined HCC cholangiocarcinoma. And the uh, reason that there is no cutoff is that there is no data to support any cutoff. So we don't have outcome data to say uh, what percentage of cholangiocarcinoma uh, will be significant. So if you have a very minor component, uh, like the examples that you were giving, so let's say there's a tumor which is predominantly HCC and there is focal glandular differentiation and you have convinced yourself that that is malignant, it's not ductal reaction at the periphery, then the way I've handled those cases is that I would say that it's a hepatocellular carcinoma with either focal glandular differentiation or a minor component of cholangiocarcinoma 
And the surgeons and oncologists will kind of take that into consideration. So if you say there's only 5% cholangiocarcinoma component, and it may not trigger the treatment uh, that is typically used for cholangiocarcinoma. But there is no such uh, uh, distinct cutoff. And in uh, these cases, the management will have to be based uh, on the individual patient and the clinical setting. Now, we can only state what we see in these cases and say that there is no definite uh, you know, cutoff data to support uh, one versus the other diagnosis. Uh, the other question that was uh, raised uh, before was about hepatoid carcinomas, which I did not uh, address. So hepatoid carcinomas are, you know, they're rare tumors, which uh, by definition arise outside the liver. And uh, they are uh, stomach, pancreas, you know, wide variety of sites uh, have been uh, described. And uh, as the name indicates, they look like uh, HCC, and that's why the name hepatoid, or at least they have a component uh, which looks like HCC. They may or may not have an associated glandular component with them. So they are referred to as either hepatoid carcinomas or hepatoid uh, adenocarcinomas uh, sometimes. So if you have a hepatoid carcinoma, it is indistinguishable from HCC, and that's by definition. So both by morphology and immunostochemistry, it shows hepatocellular features. So there is no way based just on uh, uh, the hepatocellular markers and morphology that you can distinguish uh, hepatoid carcinomas from an HCC because they are by definition identical. So the features that help are that, of course, by definition, hepatoid carcinomas arise outside the liver. So if there is no tumor in the liver, then you know that it's not HCC. And it's uh, in rare instances when you have a hepatoid carcinomas which can metastasize to liver, that's extremely rare. But it can happen. And in those cases, this difficulty may arise. I've had a couple of cases in which the primary uh, tumor, the hepatoid carcinoma, was in the colon. And uh, those tumors showed very strong staining for you know, CDX2, which is not a definite uh, for the diagnosis. But you know, if with all the other uh, context, it, uh, favored, it favored that it was a hepatoid carcinoma. But in general, it has to be a diagnosis based with a combination of uh, you know, clinical features, the setting. If you have a large gastric mass, even if it is metastasized to the liver, if you have you know, two or three liver nodules and a large gastric mass, then it's most likely that it's a hepatoid carcinoma from the stomach and not uh, an HCC which metastasized to the stomach. So you just have to keep the clinical context in mind uh, to make this diagnosis. Great, wonderful. Okay, so shall I proceed? Sure. Okay. So I... I talked to you about uh, a variety of tumors which are uh, keratin negative, and uh, we also saw uh, neuroendocrine marker positive tumors like adenocortical and paragangliomas, which are keratin negative. So, to uh, wrap up that discussion, let me uh, show you this case, which is a 64 year old with uh, a liver biopsy. And uh, the imaging also showed that there was a 3 centimeter pancreatic tumor, and that was thought to be the primary site, and liver was thought to be the metastasis. And as here you have the tumor, low power view, you can see there's abundant uh, fibrous stroma in some portions. Here you can see these very well delineated nests of cells, maybe even some SNR or glandular-like uh, configurations. And here's a closer view of the tumor cells. I'm showing this kind of nested, you can see trabecular appearance in some places. And uh, they have this uh, moderate uh, to abundant cytoplasm. Once again, that kind of polygonal cell look to them. And you can consider, based on this morphology, that um, this could be a neuroendocrine tumor. And uh, synaptophysin and chromogranin were negative, or both patchy positive, rather. And there was a pancreatic uh, mass, so this could be a metastatic uh, pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor. And the hepatocellular markers were uh, negative in this case. And uh, as opposed to the uh, other cases that we were seeing, the keratin is positive here. So we are not in the keratin negative, but keratin positive category. And uh, markers of uh, neuroendocrine differentiation uh, being positive uh, in this case. And then this stain was done, which actually gave us the correct diagnosis. This is not a neuroendocrine tumor. This is trypsin stain, and this was a metastatic acinar cell uh, carcinoma. This is another 
um, few more that you should keep in mind when you see a positive staining for neuroendocrine markers. In the vast majority of cases, uh, neuro uh, synaptophysin and chromogranin are only focally positive, so you know, less than a third of the tumor cells will typically be positive in uh, SNR cell carcinoma. But they can morphologically very closely uh, resemble uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So if you uh, pay attention to the morphology, you may be able to see some of the tumor cells which have this uh, you know, granular cytoplasm, and these are the uh, zymogen granules. And if you do a PSD, uh, they will highlight these granules. But the PSD may not be very sensitive for this, and it's uh, trypsin or chymotrypsin that should be obtained to uh, make in this diagnosis. In the metastatic setting especially, you may not have a prominent acinal architecture. It may be more nested and sheet-like. Uh, one of the very typical features in acinal cell carcinoma is, uh, that you'll read, it, especially in textbooks, is that it has very large prominent nucleoli, which uh, is uh, you know, true in most of the cases. And uh, it is said that if you, the nucleoli are so big that if you, you know, stare at them, they almost stare back at you. And the feature to keep in mind is that prominent nuclei may not always be you know, very clearly apparent, especially in metastasis. In fact, uh, the um, a few cases that I've seen in the last couple of years, uh, none of them had the classic SNR cell prominent nucleoli in the uh, metastatic setting. And as I mentioned, it's the trypsin and chymotrypsin that makes the diagnosis. So once again, uh, you may ask the question, like, what's the importance of making this diagnosis uh, as opposed to that of a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. Well, SNR cell carcinomas have much uh, more aggressive clinical course than uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, the treatment in SNR cell carcinomas uh, is just like a ductal adenocarcinoma, so the same chemotherapy is used. So the treatment is very different from uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, in terms of uh, the molecular profile, around uh, uh, not 10 to 20 percent of acinar cell carcinomas will show uh, fusions or in, uh, indels in the BRAF gene. And this is not the uh, uh, typical BRAF V600E mutation that you get in a wide variety of tumors. Uh, you, know, you get that in uh, you know, uh, colon cancers and uh, thyroid tumors and a variety of other settings. And, uh, that's a hot spot mutation, but that's not what you get in SNR cell carcinomas. You get uh, uh, this BRAF uh, fusion. In fact, I had a case uh, in which uh, an abdominal, large abdominal mass was biopsied, and it uh, just showed kind of a the morphology which resembled neuroendocrine tumors, but it was much more uh, atypical. And the SNR cell carcinoma was actually not uh, even thought about. Uh, in that case, until uh, it was sequenced, and once the BRAF uh, uh, abnormalities were noted, then trypsin and chymotrypsin were done, and they were diffusely positive in those tumors. So sometimes it's the other way around that now the molecular profiling is giving us uh, clues on how to work up uh, you know, tumors that don't show your classic features. Okay, let's uh, uh, deviate a little bit and look at. Um, a slightly different category of tumors. So this is a 32-year-old with uh, a large liver mass which was uh, detected uh, during workup for abdominal pain and a core needle biopsy uh, was obtained. So here is a portion of the liver biopsy and here you can see just some ductile reaction, mostly benign uh, uh, liver parent came up with some just reactive changes. So this was uh, around a half of the biopsy showed these features, and here's the other half, which uh, uh, showed this uh, low power view, showed this you know, uh, tumor which has this uh, prominent fibromyxoid stroma, and it, you can see that the tumor cells are kind of encircling and entrapping the portal tract here. And here's a closer view, showing you these uh, individual uh, tumor cells. Uh, you can see in this, at this magnification that they have these a large hyperchromatic appearing nuclei and somewhat uh, a spindle to epithelioid kind of morphology. And you can see abundant uh, the fibromyxoid uh, stroma here. So here's a closer view of the tumor cells. You can see you know, some of them have slightly eccentric nuclei. Some of them are more elongated, around two ovals, kind of a mixed morphology in a myxoid stroma. And here, uh, there appears to be a vacuole in a tumor cell as well, 
and here almost like a triangular shaped uh, tumor. So, so kind of a varied morphology in a fibromyxoid stroma. And here's another tumor cell which has kind of this vacuolated appearance. So this uh, sort of infiltrating the tumor cells and sort of this vacuolated appearance in a you know, abundant fibromyxoid stroma, uh, along with this immunostochemical profile of uh, you know, strongly positive CK7. So you can see the ductules here, and the tumor cells are you know, strongly positive for CK7. The workup, the other workup that was done was for other adenocarcinoma like TTF1 and so on and so forth, and all, all of that was negative. So it was the CK7 positivity and this kind of morphology that uh, initially led, and there's another CK7 you can see positive in the tumor cells. So the initial course was that this was uh, initially diagnosed as an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma because of uh, uh, the combination of features that I showed you. The patient was put on a gemcitabin-based chemotherapy because the tumor was thought to be uh, unresectable. So one year later, there was no change in uh, the size of the tumor. Uh, and since the tumor did not respond, uh, it was uh, sent for a second opinion. So we saw this case. So let's go back to the morphology of this tumor. And uh, I will point out once again the very characteristic features here, which uh, point to the diagnosis based on the H&E. So the you know, characteristic loose mixoid stroma, sort of spindly to epithelioid appearing tumor cells. These intracellular, what looks like intracellular kind of vacuoles, almost stellate shaped cells here. So all this, whenever you see this appearance in a liver, this is a very characteristic of uh, an epithelioid hemangiotheliome. And these are what are known as blister cells. And these are abortive uh, you know, intracellular lumina, which appear like vacuolated cells and you know, were mistaken in this case for vacuolated uh, uh, epithelial tumor cells. And of course, CD31 was uh, strongly positive. And this case also highlights the pitfall of uh, uh, keratin stain, including CK7 and pan-keratin. And these stains can be positive, not only in vascular tumors, but virtually any mesenchymal tumor. So if you take you know, lyomysarcomas and you know other sarcomas, uh, uh, just less commonly, but in rare gists, you can see some patchy uh, keratin staining. So just based on uh, keratin staining, you should not be diagnosing tumors, which especially with uh, these uh, uh, single cells and, uh, as uh, uh, epithelial. And angiosarcomas as well as epithelial hemangiotheliomas are well known to not only be just focally positive, but diffusely and strongly positive, especially with bad keratin. The clues to the diagnosis of epithelial and hemangiotheliomas are uh, its zonation, which uh, you know, may not always be apparent, especially in the needle biopsy. But if you have a resection, the uh, zonation is very characteristic. So you see a mixoid hypocellular uh, stroma in the center with the very few tumor cells. And as you go away from the center, it becomes more and more cellular with infiltrating cords of cells with the blister cells, like I showed you. And then at the periphery, you see that uh, the tumor cells are infiltrating along the sinusoids uh, in the adjacent uh, liver. So this zonation is a very characteristic feature of uh, you know, this tumor. Now, this uh, tumor recently has been shown to have some very uh, uh, typical translocations. So the two of them are listed here. The first one is far more common. And what it leads to is overexpression of this CAMTA-1 uh, protein. And immunohistochemistry for CAMTA-1 is available and that can help in challenging cases uh, to establish the diagnosis of uh, um, this tumor. And uh, this, uh, the second translocation is much uh, less common. And in these tumors, you have overexpression of uh, TFP3. So here's an example of an epithelioid hemangiotheliomas. And you can see that these infiltrating cords of tumor cells, uh, abundant stroma here. And this is a CAMTA-1 stain, which is showing strong uh, nuclear uh, staining. So this can be very helpful in, especially if you have you know, small biopsies or more limited tumor, you have strong keratin staining. Uh, but in most cases, CAMTA-1 is not really needed because uh, with the morphology and positivity for vascular markers, you can do CD31, 
or one of the uh, transcription factors like ERG, and uh, those can clearly establish endothelial differentiation. And uh, you really don't need the CAMTA one for uh, diagnosis in vast majority of cases. Okay, let's uh, move on and look uh, at another somewhat related case. So this is another young patient, a 33-year-old with uh, hepatomegaly, ascites, and jaundice. Workup for the liver disease was negative. Extensive workup was done. There was no hepatic or extra hepatic masses. And specifically, imaging was done to even uh, uh, rule out any vascular diseases like uh, BSR2 obstruction, there was no evidence of heart disease, uh, uh, no portal layer, no thrombosis was noted. And here's what the liver biopsy showed. So this is a very low power view, a very fragmented biopsy, and uh, low power you can see that this may be either artifact or these are dilated sinusoids. Uh, let's take a closer look. And I remind you of the history that there was no liver mass on imaging. So here is a closer view of these very fragmented kind of biopsy. And it does look like the sinusoids are you know, more prominent here, even though it uh, kind of looks like the biopsy is falling apart. And here are uh, the uh, hepatocytes, uh, maybe focally thick plates here, lined by these prominent sinusoids with prominent lining cells. Here's another view of uh, and the uh, liver biopsy showing you the identical features. There's a bile duct, uh, so they were portal tracts. So it, we knew it was not FCC just based on the fact that portal tracts were present uh, throughout the biopsy. And uh, very wide uh, you know, sinusoids here. I'm just going to show you this is the same view showing the same features, wider sinusoids, prominent lining cells here. Same features again. Um, prominent lining cell with wide sinusoids. So this bio, when this biopsy was done, the initial diagnosis that was suggested was that this is a venous artery obstruction. And because of the, you know, these wide sinusoidal sinusoids. And uh, this patient actually underwent a repeat biopsy because they could not find any underlying etiology. And the patient had, uh, as I showed you, jaundice society as a patient was actually very sick. And they had but they did a repeat biopsy, which actually showed the same features as uh, this one. And uh, at that point, we saw the case. And what I want to point out to you here is that when you see this kind of uh, case, the most important finding here is that you have to note the sinusoidal lining cells here. And here is the um, ERG stain, which is the transcription factor for endothelial cells. And you can see how it brings it out, how prominent these lining cells those are, and uh, even the, it, uh, actually you can sometimes even overlook that, that you have this diffuse proliferation of uh, cells with endothelial differentiation lining these dilated sinusoids. And K67 shows that the very high proliferation rate, virtually all of them are positive in K67. And even P53 is highlighting nearly all of those tumor cells with a strong uh, staining. So this is a vascular tumor, and it's strongly positive for P53 with TI67. And this is one of the you know, uh, patterns that's very well known with the angiosarcoma that can be easily overlooked on, uh, on the biopsy. And on the imaging, you may not see a distinct mass in around 20% of the cases. And these uh, are the uh, tumors that will show you know, sinusoidal infiltration and uh, like a peleosis uh, like pattern, uh, like it was seen in uh, this case. And then um, the more characteristic appearance of angiosarcoma, of course, is a mass forming, and then you see the typical anastomosing vascular channels. Uh, and they, if you see that, then the diagnosis is kind of more obvious. But it is the sinusoidal pattern that I really wanted to highlight. And this is a nice uh, public, recent publication which. Uh, discusses all the uh, patterns that you see in angiosarcoma very well. So how about the epithelial and hemangiosarcoma uh, versus angiosarcoma? Now, in most cases, uh, the diagnosis can be, you know, the distinction can be made, uh, based on HNE. But both are vascular tumors, so they're going to show uh, 
positive staining for the vascular markers, but uh, the zonation, the blister cells, the lack of malformed vessels in uh, EHE, and the fact that the cytologic ATP is much more less prominent. And the chemtalon stain can really help if you really have to make that distinction. Well, angiosarcoma, the classic appearance, of course, is anastomosing vascular channels and destructive invasion with the much higher Ki67 and diffuse P53. Uh, the reason that this distinction is important is angiosarcoma is extremely aggressive tumor and uh, it's virtually like a death sentence. So, while epithelial and angiothelioma is uh, sort of shows intermediate uh, uh, aggressive behavior, uh, the outcome is very variable. Uh, some patients do very well with resection, uh, while uh, others. Uh, uh, cases can recur and metastasize, and you just can't predict based on morphology how the um, uh, epithelial hemangiothelioma will behave. And uh, there have been cases in which uh, the undersectable epithelial hemangiothelioma's which are confined to the liver have even been transplanted. So that's the reason it's important to make uh, the distinction between these two. Okay, let's move on to another case which can closely mimic uh, angiosarcomas, and that's why I want to uh, highlight this case. Um, well, this is a typing error, this is not 251, but it's a 51-year-old woman uh, who has a uh, NASH cirrhosis, and uh, there's a liver mass on imaging, which grew from 1.1 uh, to 1.6 centimeters, and for that reason, and the fact that this was a static background, there was a concern that this is uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So here's the morphology of this tumor. So here is uh, in the uh, non-tumor liver here. And then you, here you can see the proliferation of tumor. It's very well demarcated from the adjacent liver. So let's take a closer look at the tumor. So you have these uh, you know, diffuse arrangement of these tumor cells which have a very uniform uh, appearance. And it looks fairly vascular here. I want to show you a closer look. Yeah, here's a closer look at the tumor. So there's some variation in nuclear shape and size, but overall cytologic atypia is not striking at all. Very mild at best. And you can see that there's very prominent vascularity in uh, this tumor. It may even remind you of some of the tumors that I showed you earlier uh, in the liver, like, you know, like angiomyolipoma. So those are the kind of things that you should be thinking about when you see this uh, sort of a streaming kind of a look with uh, without distinct uh, cell boundaries. And here's yet another look to this tumor, showing you the cytologic features. And you can see the vessels here. Okay, so let's see uh, how this tumor turned out to be. So, of course, the consideration was HCC cholangiocarcinoma based on cirrhosis, but it doesn't really look like one. And uh, the uh, immunistry chemistry also supported it was keratin negative and uh, HEPAR negative. So, the uh, uh, tumor, when it was sent uh, to us for consultation, uh, it, uh, these, this tumor CD45 had been done. And based on that, the uh, hematopoietic neoplasm was uh, raised and uh, you know, CD3 was done and CD20 was done, and they only highlighted some isolated cells. And you can see CD68, a macrophage marker, is highlighting a lot of the cells, but uh, you can also see that a lot of the background cells are negative. So it's probably a histocytic infiltrate, which was CD45 positive and um, hematopoietic. It's not really a hematopoietic neoplasm. So what else? How about melanoma, angiomyolipoma? I have to admit that when I I saw this case, I really thought that it might turn out into an angiomyolipoma. And, uh, you know, HMB45 all that was negative, so so my theory didn't work. It was not an angiomyolipoma in this case. So let's go back to the morphology here. So you can see these very uniform um, tumor cells, and then one of the features that uh, was actually quite striking on the h &E, and I deliberately did point it out, is... Uh, that a lot of these cells which are lining these vascular spaces are similar to the cells which are between the vascular spaces. And so of course, the, that brings in the possibility that this is, is this, are we dealing with a vascular tumor? And then here's the CD34, which is strongly positive in the uh, 
tumor and full are the endothelial markers. ERG and FLY1, both uh, you know, transcription factors, very strongly positive in the tumor cells. So it clearly indicated that we are dealing with a vascular tumor here in the liver. And uh, so these are the vascular neoplasms that occur in the liver. We have to choose between a hemangioma, an epithelial and hemangiotothelioma, and angiosarcoma. And it certainly doesn't look like the latter two. We already saw examples of that, and there's so minimal atypia. But you always have to be a little careful, you know. As I showed you, angiosarcomas can sometimes be, can show very, very well differentiated uh, kind of morphology, but they are still are very aggressive tumors, even though they may kind of look low grade morphologically in some cases. So there's a P53, which really did not show much of nuclear staining, and, and the proliferation rate was also very low. And this is a tumor that I wanted to show you, which was recently described, and two different uh, entities have been uh, described, and they probably represent the same, or very closely related entities. The one is a hepatic small vessel neoplasm, and the other name is anastomosing hemangioma. Uh, the case that I showed you had much more compact uh, vessels, uh, but many of these tumors actually have um, more anastomosing vascular pattern like you see in this case. And you can see the adjacent liver is being infiltrated here. And that can easily lead to uh, a mistaken diagnosis of angiosarcoma, that it's infiltrating the adjacent liver. And here's another of this uh, tumor showing you this um, anastomosing vascular pattern. You can have vascular thrombosis and areas of you know, infarction that have been replaced by fibrosis. So it can very closely mimic angiosarcoma based on its pattern. And here's a closer view. Uh, you often see this kind of hobnailed appearance of the lining cells. And uh, the point to note here is that there is minimal cytologic atypia here. And uh, it really helps to do K67 and P53 in these cases um, because it uh, the low proliferative rate uh, will further support that you're dealing with the either anastomosing hemangioma or a small vessel neoplasm and not dealing with angiosarcoma. And uh, the fact that this was uh, very well circumscribed in the case that I showed you uh, favors that it is an anastomosing hemangioma. So the publication, one of the important differences between the two that has been stated is that uh, hepatic small vessel neoplasm is uh, uh, infiltrative while anastomosing hemangioma is well circumscribed. And anastomosing hemangioma has been described in a wide variety of other sites, including kidney and soft tissue, GI tract, and so on. And hepatic small vessel neoplasm is probably very closely related, to, if not the same uh, tumor. But keep in mind that uh, uh, you have a benign vascular tumor, which can have an infiltrative pattern like you see in angiosarcoma. Okay, this is the last one for today. And uh, going by the theme of uh, keratin negative tumors, I've, uh, I'm highlighting this case, which uh, no, I've, I've seen a few cases. This is still, I think, an uncommon or rare entity. 58 year old with uh, weight loss and imaging showed a large gastroesophageal mass uh, and a large celiac nodes. Uh, a biopsy was done from this ulcerated mass and it once again did not uh, yield diagnostic tissue. And there were multiple liver lesions and a liver biopsy uh, was done. So here's the liver biopsy. And you can see benign liver and this side of the biopsy. And here you can see these uh, tumor cells. Let's uh, take a closer look at them. So here's like a sheet-like proliferation. No, when any, no, no specific patterns of arrangement or architecture of these tumor cells. And uh, even at this magnification, you can see that there's the marked uh, nuclear pleomorphism. Here's a closer look showing you the marked nuclear atypia in these cases, in this case. And uh, in at least some of the tumor cells, you can see that uh, the nuclei are eccentric. Let's see here. Yeah, it's a nice example. Eccentric nucleus. And... Uh, has sort of a plasma cytoid look to it. And you can even think of uh, you know, a plasma blastic lymphoma or a you know, rhabdoid kind of a morphology in uh, uh, at least some of the tumor cells. So basically what we are dealing with is sort of a very poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm, which is not giving much in terms of clues on which direction it might be differentiating. It, this is what 
the entirety model of the group. Well, let's examine what um, the workup showed. It was a keratin negative. Hepatocellular markers were negative, and so the other markers that were done for adenocarcinomas of different sites, they were all negative as uh, well in this case. And uh, mark 31, you can see there was some patchy membrane staining, which suggested that it could be an adenocarcinoma. And we know that there was a gastroesophageal large mass, which was the possible primary site, which also went along with the fiber. But this could be an adenocarcinoma, but it didn't really have any glandular differentiation. And even the keratin was negative, which was unusual. Here's a synaptophysin. You can see patchy synaptophysin, but it's pretty strong in some cells, but it's quite patchy. And as Dr. Monita raised uh, the possibility earlier, you know, you're always are wondering, uh, are we dealing with the endocrine tumor here or not? The chromogranin is negative, and uh, I'm not showing you here, but even the INSM1 was done, and that was negative. And a wide variety of tumor uh, markers for melanoma, for GIST, angiomyolipomas, vascular tumors, muscle markers, they are all negative in this case. So basically we're dealing with a uh, uh, very poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm. And uh, I actually didn't put it here, but EMA was uh, focally positive. So are we dealing with a neuroendocrine carcinoma? It's an autophysin positive, it kind of favors that, but uh, uh, the morphology doesn't uh, uh, kind of favor it, and uh, even the RV was intact in this case. Could it be adenocarcinoma? It could be Mach 31 positivity uh, in uh, primary in the G junction, and uh, second the negativity is kind of unusual. Pan keratin totally negative in such tumors is a little unusual. So here is what I uh, wanted to show you in this case, and that is a loss of uh, a smart A4. And you can see the nuclear staining and the background stroma, some endothelial cells, maybe some lymphocytes, but it's totally negative in the tumor cells. So what is smart A4? So this is a, a part of a chromatin remodeling complex, and I'm not going to go into detail, and myself not really an expert on this, of uh, the chromatin remodeling with SWE SNF components. This is actually a very complex biology involved on how chromatin is remodeled um, based on a variety of components. Uh, I have listed only a few of them here. And uh, mutilations or uh, loss of function, uh, which could occur because of methylation, and one or more of these components can lead to uh, a loss of uh, chromatin remodeling, which plays a very important role in differentiation. And that's why uh, a lot of these tumors tend to have this kind of undifferentiated look to it. So what are the common components of uh, you know, this uh, complex? So some of them you're familiar with, SMARC B1 or INI1. So we know that this has been very well described with the uh, you know, proximal type epithelial and sarcoma, a wide variety of other tumors, you know, soft tissue tumors as well. And small A4, which is uh, was lost in this case, also known as BRG1. So, you know, it's kind of confusing all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, acronyms and then many synonyms for each uh, you know, acronym. But what I want to point out is that uh, the loss of one or more of these components has been described in... Um, uh, you know, poorly differentiated or undifferentiated carcinomas in the GI tract you know, at many sites. And I, I've particularly seen many cases now in uh, uh, the gastroesophageal region, but they've been described in the intestine and the colon as well. And uh, this is not really any, you know, novel entity. It's just a poorly differentiated or undifferentiated carcinoma, uh, which now we are uh, finding out that the underlying molecular mechanism of it may be uh, that it's a loss of uh, you know, uh, one of these uh, uh, components. So the importance of knowing this is that uh, um, these can show patchy synaptophysin, like I showed you, and these can be mistaken uh, for neuroendocrine neoplasm. So that's important to keep in mind. Now, this case was keratin negative, but a vast majority of them do show some focal keratin staining, but uh, on a biopsy, you may or may not uh, have it. So kind of a mixed morphology, maybe spindle, some cases can be a rhabdoid, but uh, not all cases are rhabdoid. You would think with INI loss, the case may be a rhabdoid, but uh, some of them actually don't have rhabdoid morphology. 
And the variable staining can be seen with a wide, wide variety of markers. Uh, my mental is usually positive, so that can lead you down the wrong path that this is not an epithelial tumor. And these have uniform poor outcome. So once again, I want to emphasize that uh, a loss of these components is not really specific for carcinomas of these sites. They are seen in a wide variety of tumors, soft tissue tumors, uh, carcinomas at other sites. And uh, there's no specific treatment uh, for this, at least not yet. And I think the only importance of knowing this is not to mistake this for non-epithelial tumors, especially given the fact that keratin can only be focally positive or even negative in some cases. So you can always get an EMA, which is uh, positive in some of the keratin negative cases, like in this example. So this is something to keep in mind whenever you are dealing with um, well, undifferentiated or poorly differentiated you know, carcinoma, which uh, may have arisen in the GI tract. All right, so we, uh, I want to close with uh, the story, and I've been fascinated with uh, uh, liver pathology, and uh, it's uh, not surprising that, that this fascination actually dates back to prehistoric times when uh, human beings, uh, when they were hunters, they were fascinated by liver even at that time. And this is a very interesting story where, you know, four uh, uh, guys were hiking with their dog, in uh, a small place you know, called Lasco in France, and their dog got lost. So while they were looking for their dog, they stumbled upon these caves, uh, which had these uh, you know, prehistoric uh, paintings dating back uh, many thousands of years. And as you can see in this, in this picture here, that uh, there's a large liver that has been uh, depicted here. So even the prehistoric humans, uh, you, know, you can imagine their fascination when they opened these animals or killed them. And then they saw this, you know, large, uh, you know, red beefy organ uh, occupying the abdomen, and it's uh, no surprise that uh, you know liver was thought to be the you know soul or the seat of the soul of the uh, body for you know many centuries. And as we learned more and more about uh, in the uh, uh, biology, we have learned now that the liver has lost its uh, you know central importance as being the soul of the body to maybe the heart or even the brain. But I think the fascination with the you know, liver continues, uh, both in art and architecture and popular culture in history. And I'll just give you a couple of examples from the Indian context. Uh, you know, I really didn't know what liver is called in, you know, in Hindi. So I just looked it up. So these are hardly words uh, which uh, mean liver. And, uh, you know, kaleja or jigar are uh, words that you... Uh, often associate in the language with courage. So you can see that uh, there's fascination uh, of positive association with the liver, uh, even in the language. And for those of you who are you know, fans of uh, cinema, you would of course remember these uh, you know, famous lines which were penned by Gulzar for this movie Omkar, says that the uh, liver is full of fire. So the liver continues to cap capture the fascination and I hope it captures your fascination too and you enjoy liver pathology you know as much as uh, I do so thank you again and uh, I'm around if there are any more questions uh, thank you Dr. Thakur uh, we can see how much you love and are passionate about uh, liver and uh, uh, I thank you for sharing such excellent questions there are uh, such excellent cases there are some questions uh, some uh, questions uh, regarding the clinical practice at your center, uh, whether you get liver tissue in HCC patients, which are straightforward and in, on radiology. Uh, so again, I'm sorry, I missed the question. So the question is whether in your clinical practice at your center, do you get liver tissue in the HCC patients, which are straightforward? Oh, okay. So as we know, the guidelines from the uh, both the European and the U.S. societies are that, uh, especially in cirrhotic liver, if you have classic imaging, you do not need uh, a liver biopsy uh, to make the diagnosis. So our hepatologists here typically do not biopsy in cirrhotic liver unless they are atypical uh, imaging findings. So most of the cases that we are getting are not classic. But, uh, you know, this is a very long discussion, and I think that uh, 
the practice should change and there's a lot of editorials in um, hepatology and there's a back and forth editorials also on whether liver biopsy should be done if you see the advances that have been made in the targeted therapies and a lot of other sites such as lung the liver is really lagging behind nothing works in hcc all the trials have been negative uh, so far and uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and in most uh, recently immunotherapy has given some benefit but in general nothing works because hcc is being treated as one disease hcc is not one disease so unless you biopsy you profile and the tumors individually you cannot come up with targeted therapies so i am always advocating that biopsy should be done but so far it's that's not the clinical practice and uh, i can tell you that uh, the uh, radiology uh, categorization that is used uh, for liver tumors you know it's a lyrad scoring scheme so based on the lyrad scheme you can have a tumor tumor just categorized from 1 to 5 5 being definite hcc and you know i have a list of cases with me which have lyrad 5 which are not hcc so some of them are cholangiocarcinomas a um, couple of them are fnh cases so there are cases uh, which are radiologically diagnosed as hcc but don't turn out to be but i think still the sensitivity and specificity of lyrad 5 is still quite high so that's why in clinical practice the biopsy is not done in these cases okay great right. another question is uh, you did to earlier was uh, hepatic small vessel neoplasm and distinguished it from angiosarcoma there is a question how we differentiate it from uh, epithelioid hemangiothelioma yeah, epithelioid hemangiothelioma typically uh, does not Uh, enter into the differential diagnosis because the morphology is very distinctive. So in uh, hepatic small vessel neoplasm, you will have uh, vascular channels that are anastomosing; they are better formed. The example I showed you is very unusual in which they are very closely packed. Uh, typically, you don't don't have myxoid stroma like you have in epithelial hemangioma thelioma. Uh, well formed vessels are not seen in epithelial hemangioma thelioma that you see in uh, hepatic small vessel neoplasm. so the uh, characteristic uh, zonation the blister cells the myxoid stroma so all those help in epithelial hemangiothelioma mm-hmm. while anastomosing vascular pattern with kind of a hobnail endothelial cells uh, with doubt cytologic atypia would favor uh, anastomosing hemangioma or a hepatic small vessel neoplasm okay uh, just uh, stop presenting so that we can see you oh okay So, uh, two questions regarding IHC. Uh, one is about uh, experience of CK20 expression in HCC. I think you covered that also with CDX2 positivity can be seen sometimes. And yeah. uh, the question is, is it apparent or does it have any clinical relevance? Yeah. So both CK20 and CDX2 uh, can be positive. I think it's around five to ten percent. I've seen a few cases. Uh, I don't know of any clinical relevance of CK20 screening. and i i've seen it in cases which just look like it you see and i won't have done it somebody did it and sent it to me that's why i saw it but uh, yeah it's good to keep in mind that you can see that okay is regarding trips and stain uh uh in the experience uh, this is dr uh, paramita roy she is asking that you showed a brilliant uh, trips and stain stain but to her trypsin is always patchy and weak so uh, does it always work uh, or uh, do you have any uh, recommendations uh, regarding clone or uh, any tips regarding the behavior of the antibody yeah i agree that the behavior, the antibody be- does behave in a finicky way sometimes so in our like our lab my experience has been that it worked pretty well for many years and then suddenly it started staining everything else also and then we had to re-standardize it so what we have done as a kind of a measure to address that is that we also have chymotrypsin and chymotrypsin gives has given very good results so if we are uh, strongly suspicious uh, of a tumor you can get either of those two stains and if you're not very happy with it you can get the other one too now uh, so that's one solution that you can get chymotrypsin if you are If you want the clone and all, I can send it to you. I don't know off off hand. Okay, great. 
question is regarding to you advocate liver biopsy from mass as well as from neighboring liver uh, i would strongly advocate it but it doesn't happen <laughs> in vast majority of cases that doesn't happen yeah but yeah it would certainly be a good idea to do it uh, uh, to get an idea about the background liver it would be great yeah. okay so uh, the question is about the behavior of uh, hepatic small vessel neoplasm which i think you've already covered and uh, any anti glycan 3 monoclonal antibody in the pipeline so i guess the question is about targeted uh, therapy in uh, hcc which yeah. uh, pointing so far but do you have any molecular uh, testing that you do as a as a routine for uh, hepatic tumors Uh, not as a uh, routine. The oncologists will sometimes sequence uh, you know, anything, and they are just looking for targets if they can do anything. But basically, you know, nothing. But um, I have done sequencing for or diagnosis in selected cases. So if it's a, a poorly differentiated tumor in a cirrhotic liver, and uh, if I'm not sure even after doing all the immunohistochemistry whether it's HCC or cholangiocarcinoma. and i know that it can it there will be treatment implications so i have sequenced those cases and uh, similarly at the benign end of the spectrum if you are not sure whether it's uh, an adenoma or it's cc and, and in some cases it can have an implication if it, it's going to be resected anyway then there's no need to do molecular analysis but if it's a biopsy and patient is either refusing treatment or there are multiple lesions and uh, it will impact Uh, treatment then those i have sequenced and it it can be helpful uh, and if you see beta catenin mutation the ter promoter mutation it can be helpful in that setting brilliant those are the questions that we had uh, thank you so much i wish we could go on and on uh, enjoyed all your cases and uh, they were packed with uh, uh, balls of wisdom and they are really very useful and things that uh, everybody should watch out for and not take hcc for uh, granted or lightly um, thank you so much uh, dr kakkar and i hope to uh, see you again uh, sometime on this platform and thank you uh, dr nadeem uh, over to you uh, thank you so much uh, both of you dr manita and dr kakkar sanjay Um, uh, we'll be going to sleep, and he'll be here. He has to work whole day. <laughs> yeah, my day is just getting started. Just getting started, and we are almost on the bed. Um, there was one last-minute question, which I thought: uh, What is the rel relevance of molecular classification in our current practice? Which was just last typed in. So, yeah. So uh, the, the short answer is: uh, It's not important right now. and you know there has been prognostic uh, importance with proliferation class and so on you know s1 s2 s3 based on gene expression profiling and so there are uh, several classifications genetic classifications of hcc that have been proposed none of them are clinically relevant at this point yeah i think uh, now we'll close before that let me announce third february is the next lecture of uh, dr kakkar and in between between that in january we have uh, some dr danpat jain from the same group the group which you showed us yeah <laughs> and uh, i will i will uh, i will just close on one small note uh, dr manita had introduced to dr kakkar and all his academic excellence uh, let me tell you dr kakkar is an excellent debater a fantastic person to do dumb sharad we have won many uh, you know events in pgi and he plays excellent cricket he's a fantastic badminton player and a tennis player so he's just not all about uh, liver it's much beyond liver so thank you sanjay so nice of you for consenting and thank you everybody who joined us and stayed till 10 30 in the night thank you so much god bless everybody good night Good morning yeah, to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you, Dr. Monita, and thank you, Dr. Nandi. This has been a pleasure, and thank you all. Great. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye bye.